on rules, privileges, and elections being called to order. Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz and I am Chair of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. Before we begin, I would like to introduce the members of this Rules Committee present. First, we are honored to be joined by the Speaker, Corey Johnson, a member of this committee. The other members of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections present are Steve, Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Margaret Chin, Council Member, is Raf, I thought I saw Raphael, no. Council Member Vanessa Gibbons, Gibson, Council Member Rory Lansman, Richie Torres is gone, and Council Member Mark Traeger. I would like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council Lance Polivi. This is his first uh, rules meeting we're having together, and he's done a great job so far. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge the staff members from the Council's investiga Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, and a Andre Johnson Brown. We will consider the nomination by the mayor of Mr. Jeffrey Roth for appointment as the chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Should Mr. Roth receive the advice and consent of the council, he will be eligible to serve for the remainder of a seven-year term that expires on January 31st, 2024. The New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, known as the TLC, was created pursuant to Local Law 12 of 1971. Chapter 65 of the New York City Charter establishes the TLC with the goal of developing and improving taxi and limousine service in New York City. TLC is responsible for overall transportation policies. The Commission establishes certain rates, standards, and criteria for the licensing of vehicles, drivers, chauffeurs, owners, and operators. The commission includes nine members appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the council. TLC must include at least one member from each borough. TLC members are appointed for a term of seven years and can serve until the appointment and qualification of a successor. The mayor designates one TLC member to act as the chair and chief executive officer. The chair has the power to employ, assign, and oversee the officers' employees of the organization. Pursuant to the charter, the chair's position is full-time and the mayor sets co compensation. The chair currently receives $212,044 dollars annually, no, no other TLC member receives compensation. All TLC proceedings and all documents and records in its possession are public records. TLC must also submit an annual report to the council on or before the second Monday of January. I want to welcome Mr. Roth and would you please raise your right hand so the council can swear you in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and Chair Kozlowitz. My name is Jeffrey Roth, and I am honored to be here today as the nominee for Chair and Commissioner of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. I'd also like to thank the members of the Rules Committee and other members of the Council for granting me opportunity to discuss this important role and my qualifications for it. Like many New Yorkers who have made this great city home, I too came here to build a better life. After service in the military under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I wanted to find a home that would allow me to offer my authentic self in public service. New York City has allowed me to do just that. I'm a proud and gay New Yorker. 
When I landed here a dozen years ago, I spent time at the Mayor's Office of Operations under then Mayor Bloomberg and worked on interagency issues of mayoral priority. My work there led me to a role at the New York City Fire Department where I helped design and implement the risk-based inspection system which at the time leveraged data to prioritize buildings for inspection based on likelihood for a fire using data from multiple city agencies. And when Mayor de Blasio's administration took the helm, I was given an opportunity to be part of the Taxi and Limousine Commission as a deputy commissioner. With my background as an urban planner, and given the role that for hire transit services play in the overall transportation network in New York City, this was something that was very exciting to me. There, I worked on several initiatives to transform the TLC's understanding of the role of the various segments it regulates and ways to improve policy and operations. For example, I was part of the build out of the first ever municipal trip records database, including data from app companies during a time of unprecedented growth and change in the TLC regulated industries. After a short time at TLC, I was called again when the mayor and the city council created a new city agency, the Department of Veteran Services, to be part of building that organization from the ground up. To serve those who have served us is the first municipal agency of its kind in the United States recognizing the civic assets that military veterans are to New York City. I've served there for the past three years, laying the foundation of this small but impactful team that works every day to improve the lives of those who have served us, housing homeless veterans, connecting veterans, their families, and caregivers to resources they have earned, including mental health and suicide prevention resources, and finding ways to harness technology to improve service delivery. And all the while, I've served in the Army National Guard now for 20 years as a lieutenant colonel, providing strategic and operational leadership to teams large and small. I've done this in some of the world's most intense training environments, including an overseas deployment to Sinai, Egypt, alongside personnel from 13 different countries, and domestically in New York City during Superstorm Sandy. I saw firsthand the destruction of that storm on New Yorkers, many who lost their homes and livelihood. Our Guard unit worked to save lives, property, and to protect people. Now we are at a pivotal, pivotal moment that demands seasoned leadership of the TLC regulated industries which are in the midst of unparalleled change. The value of the medallion has plummeted. The FHV sector has experienced explosive growth and the city seeks ways of protecting drivers from predatory lenders who took advantage of their dream for a better life. All of this while technology has shifted the way riders connect to for hire transportation services as they try to get to and from in a safe, efficient, and cost-effective manner as possible. My focus, if appointed, will be to address ways of strengthening the yellow industry to protect drivers that own their medallions who are facing default on their medallion loans. The TLC must have their back through the immediate launch of the Driver Assistance Center and the other recommendations of the 45-day report to the mayor on efforts to support taxi drivers. We must also find ways to protect our city and its streets from unnecessary congestion, protect driver incomes, leverage data and technology to find methods for improving service efficiencies, deepen connections to diverse communities to improve equity of service across all five boroughs, ensure our streets are safe for pedestrians and cyclists, continue to grow our wheelchair accessible fleet, and underscore zero tolerance for any discriminatory service refusal based on race, ethnicity, gender, or destination, not in New York City. This duty position calls for a transformative leader who understands the importance of the TLC regulated industries and the role they play in the lives of modern day New Yorkers and our visitors and the million trips they take every single day. A leader that possesses interagency relationships to synchronize resources from across city government to support those burdened by falling medallion values and operational expertise to ensure the TLC is able to shape and enforce effective policies. In all my roles, in both city government and the military, I've worked tirelessly to find ways to create partnerships that achieve results. I will apply that same leadership to work with the city council and the taxi and limousine commissioners to find ways to address the needs of both drivers and the riding public and create policies that protect the health and vitality of these industries. Thank you for your time and consideration of me as chair and commissioner of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. I look forward to addressing any questions that you may have. Thank you. I would like to recognize the speaker for his remarks. 
Thank you, Chair Koswitz. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roth, for being here. This is a particularly important hearing, so I again want to thank Chair Koslowitz for holding this hearing today and for giving me a few moments uh, to speak. Uh, the TLC is at a critical juncture. The collapse of the medallion market has left drivers economically devastated. We are still grappling with the best ways to handle the explosive growth in the for hire vehicle sector, and congestion is getting worse throughout the city, and traffic deaths are up. The TLC has an opportunity to make a positive impact on drivers, passengers, and New Yorkers. They have the opportunity to create a system that is fair to licensees and helps us meet our greater policy goals, like having a cleaner and safer city. But to do that, we need leadership that's prepared to confront the mistakes of the past, and there have been some big ones, and to work with the council on how we move forward. I'm not sure the stakes have ever been higher at the Taxi and Limousine Commission. It simply cannot be a, a licensing bureau. It cannot turn a blind eye to the rampant corruption that has occurred in the medallion market under its watch. It needs a clear vision for the future and a plan to get us there. So I look forward to having a conversation today with you as we consider your nomination to lead this incredibly important agency on how you best see fit and uh, Madam Chair, is it okay if I begin asking questions? Thank you. So I wanna get right into the, the regulation of the uh, medallion sales. Um, a, a medallion is nothing more than a city license that we've decided to monetize. And at the end of the day, how a city license is used is a city responsibility, not federal or state regulators of credit unions or banks. The city, TLC's own rules say that it's supposed to ensure the financial stability of its licensees. That's what it says. Do you think that the TLC has any responsibility for ensuring that medallion owners aren't lured into predatory loans just to get a city license? I think, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the question. I think the uh, TLC demands two types of leadership right now. One that can step in and hit the ground running and understand that we are in crisis. Uh, my 20 plus years in the military, very common to step into a situation, size it up, and try to understand how we can bring resources to bear on it. And then the other part is uh, future operations, looking at what is the vision long term, both in the ne next two and a half years for this city council and this mayor, but also longer term in the next generation. What do these industries look like and what can we start to build towards? I think the TLC has to take a leadership role, not only in creating and crafting that vision, in partnership and collaboration with the city council and other stakeholder groups, but lay out what are the policy measures to get us to that vision. Uh, I look forward to doing that. In terms of the crisis leadership, I think the TLC must immediately stand up the driver assistant unit, work with drivers and driver advocacy groups to understand where drivers are suffering as a result of the falling medallion prices, and see what we can do to bring resources to bear to support them in navigating resources that are available at the city level, and also take a leadership role in pressuring state and federal um, authorities to look at this as well, and pressure the uh, lending institutions to come back to the table. Do you think that the TLC should apologize to the uh, medallion owners uh, who have suffered so greatly because of the inflated, overly inflated value of those medallions? Should the TLC would you apologize if you were commissioner and chair of the TLC? Would you do that today, given the crisis that we're in? I think if there are drivers in the room, I don't know if by a show of hands, are there, there are. drivers here? There are drivers I, here. I want to thank the drivers for being here today. I know that many of you are suffering and facing undue hardships and burdens as a result of the falling medallion prices. Uh, my pledge to you is knowing that there is suffering. I will work every single day to work with you, to work with the City Council, to find ways to alleviate suffering wherever possible. I think the immediate thing is to set up a driver assistant unit so that we can look at these problems and face them head on, align resources behind it, and then also engage with driver communities across the city, their advocacy, advocacy groups, drivers themselves, to understand what can we do today to help alleviate suffering. That's my pledge, not only to drivers, but to the City Council. But do you think that the TLC leadership should apologize uh, whether or not the TLC leadership there should apologize, I don't know. I know moving forward, I look forward to working with driver groups to see how we can rectify this situation. I think the TLC should apologize. And I want to say to the drivers of New York City, uh, I don't run the TLC, uh, but I'm sorry that 
uh, not just under uh, the current administration, but this is dated back a long time. I am sorry uh, on behalf of municipal government that we have gotten you in this situation through not regulating and having the oversight necessary to ensure that this didn't happen. Uh, do you think that the city owes anything to all the medallion owners that believed in the city and believed that the city was, believed the TLC was looking out for them? I think as part of the task force on the medallion uh, value, I look forward to seeing what those policy measures that come out of that. I know the TLC is part of that task force. I look forward to being part of the work and understanding what the uh, policy solutions could be. I think there are measures short of um, uh, financial bailout of any kind. I would say I think there are ways to alleviate suffering. Um, that might be sufficient and not excessive. And I also want to be very careful uh, in terms of financial support where uh, unnecessary, particularly to credit unions, that may have been involved in predatory lending. Do you think that the medallion market was properly regulated? Uh, I think there's a lot more the TLC can do, and I think that's the point of the task force is to look at ways that we can improve that oversight. I mean, you, you're not, you didn't answer the question. Do you think that the medallion market was properly regulated? I think that we can do a lot more to better regulate it. Do you think it was properly regulated? I think that it, you know, the, the changes that I saw from uh, the, the history that I have read is that there was a, lot, a lessening of the oversight of the medallions and the transfers um, from something that was fairly extensive to much less extensive. So I think there's a lot we can do to improve that oversight, and I look forward to it. And Mr. Roth, this is a little concerning to me. You and I had a very uh, cordial meeting yesterday, which I'm glad we did in advance of this hearing. And uh, I, I feel like you're not being, if this is the way we're going to interact together before you're even chair, where you will not give direct answers to this oversight body of the city council, which is considering your nomination to lead this agency today, and the fact that I said during my opening statement, this, and you acknowledge in your opening statement to this committee, that we are at one of the most critical junctures of the TLC's history. A simple question, do you think the medallion market was properly regulated? I got three different answers when I asked three different times, and I think the answer is very clear. No, it wasn't. I the New York Times investigation mm -hmm. showed it was not properly regulated. So I think we start off by saying it was not properly regulated and then give other answers. But if this is going to be the stance and posture that we're going to be in before you're even confirmed, when we have very serious questions about what's happening and we're in a moment of crisis and drivers are suffering and committing suicide and ending up bankrupt and they can't support their families, it's, that's really concerning to me. I agree that there is a lot of suffering out there, and I will work very hard to find ways that we can alleviate it. I concur. I think there's a lot of things that the TLC can do better, that the city can do better, and I think it requires leadership at the TLC level to help collaborate and build those relationships so that we can bring uh, resources to bear on these issues. So yes, I agree. I think that uh, much of the good work under the leadership of the city council, the things that you've done around the FHV cap, driver incomes, we've got to continue to build on that. I look forward to working with the task force to find ways that we can improve oversight of this and all of the TLC regulated industries, and I think there is a lot more that we can do. But, th but that's not giving a direct answer to my question. I mean, that, that you mentioned a bunch of that in your opening statement, and in some ways, I don't want to discount it, but you know, y if you were going to lead the TLC, it's about not just saying we're going to work with the task force, but as we are considering your nomination, giving us your unbridled, unvarnished opinion about what you think that leadership would take and, what, and, and where you believe things are. So I'll move on. I know that we are probably a long way off from another medallion auction but it's critical that we know how we got here. Whether or not the mistakes were made under this administration or prior administrations, I believe there is still a lot to learn about why the city was promoting medallion sales when simple math showed it would be a terrible investment for most drivers. We still don't fully understand the role OMB and City Hall uh, had in making the decision to auction off more medallions when we had certain information. Will you commit to cooperating with the City Council's investigation into the medallion crisis? I look forward to working very closely on this issue and cooperating with the, the Oversight Committee. And the Council heard a package of bills to protect medallion owners and drivers from predatory actors, including lenders, medallion brokers, and fleet managers. Have you reviewed any of those bills that uh, we have been considering and introduced? Yeah, I've reviewed those in part. You, you reviewed I have, them? I've taken and a do you look have any thoughts on them? Uh, I think, yes, I think they go a long way to addressing this. Uh, I do think that 
those are part of a lot of things that we can do. I look forward to other conversations about other ways that we can, uh, as a city, bring resources to bear on this particular issue and look forward to that collaboration. I mean, do you have anything more specific about the bills that were under consideration? You know, I, any, any concerns, anything that you think is good in those bills? I, I look forward to having discussions about the specifics of the bills, how we can implement those through the rules process, all of the specifics of it in conversation and close collaboration with the council. Mr. Roth, we, we need more specifics here today. We need to be more specific. And given the crisis that we're facing, and given the amount of suffering that's out there, we, we, we have to, whoever the next leader of the TLC is, is going to affect tens of thousands of lives of drivers and medallion owners as well as millions of New Yorkers who rely on the system. And so I, I just, I'm a little concerned that in multiple questions already, there hasn't been the level of specificity that I would expect. Do you think that the medallion model is the best way to regulate taxi cabs? Or should the city be in the business of auctioning licenses and profiting, should the city be in the business of auctioning licenses and profiting off a transfer market? I think you know what I have uh, looked at is one of the things that you know stepping into this role of confirmed uh, to do a 60-day assessment and really work with the drivers community, uh, medallion owners, owner drivers to better understand uh, the impacts of that industry and how it's currently regulated. Uh, I look forward to working with the task force on that. Um, I do know some of the specifics of the, the legislation that's been put forward by the council in terms of a business practices accountability unit, taking a deeper look at the transfer uh, documentation and paperwork to ensure in some way that there's no predatory lending taking place. I think all of those things are things that we have to do to think about how we support drivers and the medallion system. The medallion system's here today. Part of what I want to do is lay out a vision for where we go in the next two and a half years and the next generation. As part of my 60 days, I will work very closely with uh, all of the advocacy groups to try to understand and paint a picture of where do we see these industries going a generation from now, and how do we start to lay out policies that will help us move to that, that new future. But should the city, but do you think the city should be in the business of auctioning licenses and profiting off a transfer market? Given what we've seen, given the crisis we've seen in the New York Times investigation, do you I think, think that's the best model? I think we have to be very careful in our consideration of whether or not that's the best model for the city what's, to. Oh, but what's your opinion? As what's your opinion as potential chair of the TLC? I don't like the idea of the city making money off of transfers. No. Thank you. So the TLC is holding a hearing next week on rules that would limit the amount of time that for hire vehicles could spend quote unquote cruising in the central business district. And that's a pretty major policy proposal. Do you think it's appropriate to hold a hearing on such an important rule when your confirmation is pending? There is not a current leader of the TLC. Uh, why schedule it for the same day that the council is potentially voting on your appointment and confirmation? Do you think that's appropriate? Uh, you know, I, I'm not part of the scheduling of it. I do think that the immediacy and the need uh, to Im you know, pass these rules and support drivers, I think, is one of the reasons they're doing it on the 23rd. Um, I fully support the rules as I understand them. Uh, if they, they have an acting commissioner, uh, so if they decided to wait until uh, the next hearing, that would be fine. But I do think there's an immediacy in, in uh, passing these rules to support FHV drivers. I mean, my opinion is that, and you are not leading the agency, and you're not currently at the agency, so this is not on you in any way, uh, but I do not think it's appropriate, and I think that the timing to consider such a major policy proposal while your nomination is pending before this council is inappropriate in some ways. Uh, if, if the TLC, the commissioners, and the commission and the staff believe this is the best proposal, while a nomination is pending to come in and hopefully undersee a trans oversee a transformation of the MTA under your potential leadership, I would think that they would want you in that seat to be helping make that decision before they actually vote on these rules. So I do not think that uh, it is best to be timing uh, that rule at the same time, and I hope that the TLC pulls it until we 
uh, have a permanent chair of the TLC. I want to go to um, independence. How do you plan to manage your relationship with City Hall? If you were directed to implement a policy you disagreed with, what would you do? Uh, so, I, you know, I've worked now under two different mayors. Uh, I've been part of two administrations in various ways at city agencies. I think if uh, a senior official voiced to me their um, concerns or particular stance on an issue, I would consider that. Uh, I would try to understand if it was something I disagreed with, understand where they were coming from or what facts or evidence they had to support their, uh, their consideration. But I would also listen to uh, my fellow commissioners at the TLC. I would also listen to the city council. I'd also listen to the stakeholder groups and advocacy groups to understand and influence my decision making. So who do you believe you report to as uh, chair of the TLC? Well, I think there is a formal reporting structure with City Hall, but I think as a commission, it is very much responsive to uh, the advocacy advocacy groups, the stakeholders, the city council has a majority appointment and confirmation of my role. Uh, so I think uh, it's uh, formal to the city hall, but it's an independent commission. And, and what do you look uh, at as your, the way that you plan on working with uh, the, the drivers? Uh, what's your role as potential chair of the commission and working with the drivers? What, how, what would that mean to you? What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And I know it's not just about the drivers, but I think sure. that would, given the suffering that we've seen and the rash of suicides, how do you foresee working with drivers on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis? I, I think in a variety of ways. I think direct engagement as a chair and commissioner, working directly with uh, communities where drivers are and the driver advocacy advocacy groups, attending meetings, being available to drivers. Uh, one of the things that we did when I was at the TLC was um, conducted informal uh, forums or public hearings anytime we were uh, passing rules or considering rules that affected drivers to invite them to come and share their ideas. Uh, and develop close ties through, you know, the city council created the Office of Inclusion as one way to reach communities of uh, diverse communities throughout New York City. So leverage their efforts as well as the outreach team to connect with and engage with drivers across the city. I think their perspective is absolutely key uh, in any number of issues that the TLC is facing. And they probably know a lot of the policy recommendations that could move forward to improve their conditions. I mean, I think one important thing and uh, that uh, we as uh, council members learn every single day is it's important for us not just to be inside the walls of City Hall or our district offices, but to actually be out in the streets interacting with drivers where they are, whether it's where they're picking up their vehicle or at the airports or uh, wherever they may be, to hear from them on a daily basis what they're going through, what their interactions are like, because sometimes uh, are, uh, this just happens anywhere, staff can somehow cut out what is actually happening and it's best for leadership to hear directly from the people about what they're experiencing. So I, I would hope that uh, both you and all the commissioners are interacting with drivers in a um, sort of non-formal meeting setting, but where they're at to hear from them directly about what they're experiencing on a daily basis not just with their interactions with the TLC, but the struggles they're facing as New Yorkers, given the upheaval in, in the industry and the enormous amount of suffering that we've seen over these last many years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to go back uh, just to, to ask again, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not um, trying to you know, um, lean too hard here, but I think it's important uh, just to, to, to get a real clear answer, do you think that the medallion market was properly regulated? I mean, I really, given what we've seen, I just, I, and given the work that you're gonna have to potentially do, and given the work the council's looking at, I really wanna hear sort of a yes or no answer to that, but also sort of uh, for you to expound on that a little bit, if you do think it was properly regulated, if you don't think it was properly regulated, why? Mm -hmm. So I, I'll, I'll say this, uh, given the current crisis, no, it absolutely wasn't uh, properly regulated. We're in crisis, and I think we have to address the crisis. I don't know all of the uh, specifics of everything that must be done to better regulate it moving forward. I do have some sense of some of the things that need to happen. There needs to be some oversight of these transfers in the secondary market, whether that's by the TLC or another uh, city agency, there has to be that function has to exist. Um, I also think that the Business Practices Accountability Unit can look into these transfers and understand and help flag or 
highlight any instances where we think there might be something predatory. And I think that will go a long way, as well as a driver assistant unit to hear from drivers directly uh, what conditions they're facing in terms of the financial structures of the medallions, and if there are any patterns that we see to address it as a city. And I think the TLC can play a real role as a leader. We may not have all of the functions available at the TLC. We may not have all of the resources available, but we can corral those across city agencies and advocate to the state and federal level for additional resources. So given the fact that the city, and as I mentioned in my first question and the regulation of medallion sales, given the fact that the city sets the price that the medallions get auctioned off at, and given now we know the facts are clear, those were uh, way over infl inflated values, and there was, uh, there, there still are, and there were predatory actors in the business, and the city wasn't doing the proper oversight to ensure that people that were attempting to finance a medallion and purchase one, that they didn't, they didn't have the means to actually support paying uh, the cost associated with that medallion. And that is why we have seen this in a combination with the explosive growth in the four hire vehicle sector, which was unregulated for so long, and how that detrimentally impacted the yellow and green taxi sectors. Given all of that, and given that the review is going uh, forward, as you mentioned, and that you're going to come in, you'll meet with the task force, you will uh, talk to the commissioners, you'll talk to the top TLC leadership, given all of those facts, do you think at this moment, even though the review is still going on and there was some review, that uh, there was some document that was released last week preliminarily uh, in looking at this, what do we owe the drivers who were snookered, who were, uh, who were taken advantage of, who were really run out of house and home and who now the, the human stories that we're seeing of fathers and mothers with three or four or five children can't support to feed, the, can't, can't feed their children. What do we owe those families right now? What do we owe them to make sure that they are not continuing to struggle, that they are getting the support they need so that we do not see further suicides and that uh, they are not financially underwater in this way immediately, right now? What does the city owe these drivers who were uh, who are taken advantage of. I think the city owes them uh, their support and commitment to having their back. Uh, as I mentioned, the driver assistant unit, I think is one way to do that. We must, the TLC must engage with the driver's community to find ways to support them where they are suffering. The financial structures of these loans, some of which may have been predatory, I think could be reno renegotiated by uh, inviting the credit unions to the table to take a look at this. Some of that's happened already with some of the drivers, but not on a large scale. So I think we need to improve that. And I think there are other city uh, resources available that could be brought to bear to help alleviate the immediate suffering. I would coordinate and work with as a crisis center at TLC with other city agencies to find out what those resources are. We've done similar sorts of things in the veteran community with veteran homelessness and on other issues where the Department of Veteran Services doesn't have lots of resources. We're not a direct service provider. But what we can could do is convene resources, pull city agencies together, and help, uh, in this instance, veterans navigate resources that are available to them at the local, state, and federal level. I think the TLC can play the same kind of leadership role. And I know that the mayor has said uh, publicly uh, on multiple occasions that he uh, has some very serious concerns, which I think are valid with regard to if you did a bailout and you have concerns related to if you did a bailout, you could end up um, helping people that were actually involved in taking advantage of folks and that we don't want to be in the business of doing that. And the total cost of the bailout could be billions and billions of dollars, which the city doesn't have that money right now. But if there was a pared down version of a bailout targeting and focusing on the folks that um, we put up a category, we sort this out in a way where there are folks that really were taken advantage of and we figure out a partial bailout, we figure out a payment plan, we figure out something along those lines to be able to help them. So it's not a full bailout. Is that something that you're open to? I think it's one of many policy options on the table. I think it's got to be discussed. I think my main concern is that there's no uh, financial 
uh, reward going to people that took advantage of drivers. So uh, predatory credit unions or other lenders that took advantage of drivers, in no way would I want to support any kind of bailout of them. Uh. Mr. Rother, I want, really want to uh, thank you because I, I think uh, that your service uh, to the city has been exemplary. You detailed in your opening statement that after uh, you know many, many years of military service, almost 20 years in the Army National Guard serving our country, that you came to New York City to be a public servant mm -hmm. and to uh, start off working at the Mayor's Office of Operations and to work with the FDNY on protecting New Yorkers from fires and moving on to the TLC and to the Department of Veteran Services, given your uh, history as a veteran. I'm really grateful for the work that you've done. Um, I do think that we need some uh, further clarity and answers here today. And as an openly gay man, I'm really proud of your service to our country. I'm proud that you served even under the dark veil of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I'm really grateful for your service. I think that we will have some follow-up questions. Uh, I'll have some follow-up questions uh, once the staff uh, looks at uh, our answers today and your answers today. And I look forward to continuing that conversation with you. And I want to turn it back to the chair. And I appreciate your testimony here today. Uh, thank you, Chair Kozlowitz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have uh, a few questions. What policies uh, need my glasses? What policies would you enact to address some of the systemic issues with high volume for higher service, higher, high, higher services such as Uber, Lyft, Via, and Juno? Yeah. So I know, I know they recently passed uh, rules that. Uh, regulate the, uh, have created a definition for the high volume for higher vehicle sector. Um, I also am thankful to the city council for passing a cap to regulate the growth in those sectors. I think uh, the city has come a long way since uh, those app companies entered the market uh, and disrupted the entire system uh, in how we regulate all of these various segments. I think that uh, part of what I would do in that 60 days is look at uh, all of the changes. The last time I was at TLC was in early 2016. A lot's changed in the last three plus years. Uh, I'd want to work very closely with uh, the various groups that oversee the for hire vehicle side um, and see what we can do to support regulating these industries in a way that protects from congestion, protects from uh, uh, reduction in driver income, but also protects the small businesses of uh, livery-based services that are neighborhood-based uh, or uh, corporate car services and things of that nature. Would you con uh, continue the moratorium on the issuance of licenses for these type of vehicles? Yeah, I fully support that. I think with the six-month review of the TLC built into that legislation, I think is appropriate so that we can ensure that growth is uh, pacing demand. And what do you see as the long-term balance between the ty these types of app-based services and the traditional medallion taxi cab? I think that um, there's... There's a real need for a vision. I, I know uh, when the app companies came on the scene, it was a massive disrupting force that caused a lot of turmoil across the globe. A lot of cities were trying to figure out how to respond to this. I think the TLC needs to play a leadership role in thinking about what is the vision for the next generation? Where do we go, not just in the two and a, next two and a half years of this city council and this mayor in terms of shoring up these industries, protecting all the things that we hold dear in terms of these industries, but really thinking about what is the future? What is that vision? And how do we enact and align policies behind that to achieve where we want to go? OK, thank you. I would like to turn it over to my colleagues, Council Member Richie Torres. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I thought the speaker's questions were excellent and cut to the heart of the central questions regarding the medallion market collapse. I want to share with you, Mr. Roth, concerns that I've heard from the medallion owners. As you know, there's a crisis of confidence in the TLC among medallion owners who have lost their livelihood and their retirement security, whose pursuit of the American dream has become a nightmare of indentured servitude. You were formerly employed at the TLC during those years of regulatory failure that led to the market collapse 
what assurance can you give those medallion owners that you represent a new direction for the TLC rather than more of the same? Sure, when I was uh, at the TLC, um, you know, I came on board and stepped into, was it late 2014, early 2015, so it really stepped into the disruption that was occurring by these app companies. Uh, and we were trying to figure out what was going on and how best to regulate those industries. The, um, the, the current crisis that's going on, I think demands crisis leadership. Uh, my 20 plus years of military service, I've trained on this, I have been tested in this, uh, not only overseas, but here uh, in New York C City during Hurricane Sandy, when our unit was uh, activated the day before the hurricane, with little notice, we didn't know that uh, we'd be activated, pulled our soldiers in and worked very hard uh, during the storm, while the storm was ravaging, and in the immediate after, after uh, effects on saving lives, saving property, working with uh, communities to identify where people were suffering and try to get resources to them. So I've been tested in this area in terms of crisis leadership. Uh, my goal would be to get into the TLC if appointed and work very quickly to size up the situation and find out what we can do immediately to alleviate human suffering. What was your role previously at the TLC? I was deputy commissioner. Uh, deputy commissioner what area? Uh, policy and external affairs. Okay, so you're one of the leading policy makers at TLC. Uh, in the height of deregulation, the reg did you see clearly at the time the regulatory failures that ultimately led to the collapse of the market? Did you see, did you express concerns internally about the advertising, the decision to hold an auction in 2014, the market manipulation by the likes of Michael Cohen and Gene Friedman? Did you express any of these concerns internally when you were at the agency? So when I came on board, uh, my goal was to implement rules around FHV trip records. We were trying to understand the explosive growth of these industries and the impact they were having on the, uh, the yellow uh, number of trips per day, on uh, the for hire vehicle companies and drivers themselves. Um, I w my unit didn't oversee the uh, medallion sales or the auctions, we didn't have a part in that. Um, and what I was hearing from the drivers at the time of this explosive uh, change was how much competition there was and how uh, the, the lack of parity between the different segments that the TLC regulated. So we were trying to find ways to control explosive growth in the FHV sector, protect the yellow drivers and the reduction in their number of trips, uh, and that was really what was the crisis of that moment. You know, what was disheartening about the testimony of TLC at the oversight and investigations hearing that I did jointly with the transportation chair is that there seems to be, TLC was inclined to scapegoat everyone except itself, that it was the fault of the state regulators, the fault of the federal regulators. But my position is that the TLC is primarily culpable because ultimately you're in control of the medallion. There is no medallion transaction, there is no medallion loan, there is no medallion market without the TLC. It is a creature of the city of New York, it's a creature of TLC. Do, do you, are you willing to state unequivocally that as the future commissioner of TLC that you are responsible for the financial stability of the medallion market and all of its licensees? I think the TLC is uh, responsible for regulating these industries to protect the health and vitality of them and should do everything Specifically financial can. stability. Uh, I think that's included in the health and vitality of these industries. I think it has to do what it can. Now its role is limited, so I do think where the function doesn't exist at the TLC, it needs to play a leadership role in navigating where the function does exist and bring that to bear on this particular crisis. And I don't want to dwell on this, but what I'm concerned about is a repeat of history, is future market manipulation and speculation. So this is an area that has not been touched upon, but as you know, there's been, there have been hedge funds purchasing vast quantities of medallions. And something tells me those hedge funds are not terribly interested in actually running a taxi business. And so I guess my question to you is, what do you think is their motive? What is their end game? That's number one. And number two, are you committed to examining the growing presence of hedge funds in the medallion market? And are you committed to sharing the findings of your examination with the city council? I think, uh, I, I don't want to speculate as to what their, their motives may be. Um, I do want to look at their role in the system. I think part of sizing up the crisis means understanding who the active players are, 
who is coming into this market, who is taking interest in it, and finding ways to uh, protect drivers uh, in this crisis. So my commitment is to examine this, understand it, size it up, and work very closely with the task force and with the city council to create a path forward. And you would share the findings with the city council? I, I will, my findings I will share, yes, absolutely. Yes, and I, I'll, I'll end it here, one more question. It seems to me there are two kinds of players in the medallion market. There are the operators who are interested in running a taxi business for the long haul, and then there are the speculators who see the medallion as an asset to be monetized. How do we fundamentally restructure the market to incentivize long-term operation over speculation? Yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think an uh, excellent question. Uh, I, I want to speculate on how to do that in terms of the, the, the rules or the way to go about it, I, but I think that has to be an aim. Uh, and I think that aim does get us to the goal of protecting drivers and protecting the health and vitality of this system or whatever other system may come in the future. I would say answering that question is key to being a transformative leader for the TLC. Uh, that's the extent of my question. Council Member Cohen. Uh, uh, Councilmember Cohen, I just wanted to, I was remiss in my opening statement and my questions. I, I wanted to recognize Beta Vita Sai, uh, who is here with, for her unre unrelenting advocacy on behalf of drivers, not just during this current crisis that we're in, but for a very, very long time. And we partnered with her as this council passed legislation last year to finally uh, try to rein in the four hour vehicle companies. And I'm really grateful that she's here today. I look forward, I may not be able to be here for her testimony, but reading her testimony uh, and continuing to work with her on all these issues that are plaguing drivers. So Beta V, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Council Member Cullen. Uh, thank you, Chair Kozlitz. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roth, for your testimony. Um, I, I'm not on the Rules Committee, and I'm not on the Transportation Committee, and I'm not an expert in this area, but as a, you know, as a kid, I remember riding in the jump seat of the back of a, of a checker cab. So, you know, as a New Yorker, I have to say I am perplexed and confounded as to how this industry is so messed up and, and, and been messed up in such a sustained way for so long. Um, so I, I'm going to try maybe a slightly different approach. Uh, if you know, if, assuming you're confirmed, uh, this administration has two and a half years left. What does this city look like in terms of getting people around in four hire vehicles in two and a half years? What, if you have your way and you're successful, what is it going to look like? So I, I deeply care about the vision, and I think the vision is something that I want to work very closely uh, to paint a picture of that future. Whether it's two and a half years from now, I think we need a strategic plan for where we are today to where we want to go in the next two and a half years, as well as lay a foundation and roadmap for a vision of the future a generation from now. What do we think these industries look like? What's coming? Um, whether that's electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles and other things. Let's have a plan for that should that come and find policies that can shape a future that, that we envision. Um, I do think in the next two and a half years, we, it, it's a good amount of time. I think the wind is in the sails in terms of change and collaboration between the TLC, the city council, and the mayor's office. I think we need to continue that. Shore up where we can on the yellow side, support drivers who are in crisis. Um, in the military, we call that co-ops, current operations. The current operations right now is crisis, and we've got to find a way to respond to the current crisis. But in addition to that, FUOPs, or future operations, we need to look at where do we want to take these industries in the future. My goal would be, within that 60 days, to conduct okay. intensive engagement with advocacy advocacy groups to understand what does that future look like and how do we pat, paint a, a picture towards it. I guess we're all trying to pin you down though on a little bit of a specifics, at least in a, in, in a vision. I understand that you, you know, you're not going to be a dictator at TLC where your way is going to be the way. But I, I am interested in knowing, you know, you, you've been at the TLC and you have ideas about how you'd like to see changes take place. I don't even know why we have medallions, never mind the failure to regulate them. Look, is the, is the future include medallions? Do you think it should, whether it does or it doesn't, do you think it should include medallions? I, I think the immediate future, yes, it, it absolutely includes medallions. They're here. Uh, they're here for at least the, the short term. They're here for the next two and a half years. Um, I do think longer term in the future. What I have seen in all of these industries is a change or a blurring between the various segments. They used to have very defined roles and uh, segments of the population that they served. Uh, now I'm finding, though, that it's a lot more blurred. So the riding public has multiple choices, but um, the difference between getting in a livery or a black car is not so clear to the riding public. I think the future involves some recognition of this. 
that the four higher services um, might be uh, more equalized across the, the sectors. Uh, more parity. Uh, requirements that are on yellows probably apply to black cars that are retail as well. Uh, and I think all of those are components of the future. Uh, as well as really ensuring that whatever plan we come up with is tied into a longer term, larger vision for transportation overall in New York City. I think these are a critical component to servicing neighborhoods that aren't served well by mass transit, and it's vital that that be included. Uh, you know, I just want to make the point, I represent uh, the, the, as far north and as far west as you can get in the Bronx, and I will say in, okay. you know, in, with the advent of app services, uh, I believe that my constituents have more access to service than they've ever had, and that is, that is a benefit I don't want to lose. Uh, and I, I will also point out that there, you know, I, you know, I reviewed your resume. You and I have spoken offline. Uh, you obviously, you know, have the credentials to do this, but uh, there is an enormous amount of pressure. I, I, I don't, I'm sure you feel it, and I'm sure you're aware of it. And uh, sometimes, you know, we uh, frivolously throw around that there are issues of life and death, but as you know, in this industry, it has become a question of, of people's very survival. So uh, I appreciate uh, your testimony, and uh, I wish you the best. Thank you, Councilman. Councilmember Rodriguez. Chair, look, I feel that the crisis where we are today is a crisis that could be prevented. And it's not only individuals who are responsible TLC on the transaction of the set of medallions that are responsible but also that area that we're responsible to analyze the data and based on those information make projection on how the industry was changing. And especially when the city TLC uh, share information to city hall and therefore the budget director to the council on projections on how much revenue will the city receive by the sale of medallions. How do you feel did the city act by promoting the last sale of medallions in the, 20, in the one in 2014 where they advertised all the opportunity even though TLC knew, or the city knew, <laughs> that we were in front of the devaluation of medallions. Mm -hmm. So the, the leadership that implemented the auction in 2014, um, I, I don't know what they knew. I, I uh, wasn't privy to their conversations or the planning of the auction or even the auction itself, so I don't want to speculate on what they knew. Um, I do think, as stated earlier, that it's we have to be very careful as a city of uh, monetizing this in a way that um, uh, makes the, the advantage to the city the primary focus of the medallion system. So currently with the crisis as it is, I think we, we share that aim of addressing uh, the suffering of drivers, finding ways to do that, and ensuring as we move forward we learn from history and we ensure that we don't repeat that in the future. Look, chairing this committee of transportation Again, for the last couple of years, it has been opportunity for us to work with the city hall, leaders at TLC, the drivers, and all the sectors to look at this crisis. And what we are saying is that even though we have been able to work in a number of bills addressing this crisis, we have not been able to work together to be sure that we level the playing field. What changes do you think should be made in order to de redefine what a pre-arrangement is and going back to those years where we established that, in this case, the yellow taxi were the only one with exclusive right to pick up and drop up in the five boroughs of the city of New York? Yeah, I look forward to that conversation. I think, you know, as a riding public, um, the difference between putting your hand in the air and, and calling for a vehicle through your phone, um, it, 
feels different in some ways, but it's very similar in some ways. Um, I do think the distinction we've made on those areas uh, is blurry today, as are the way we regulate the various industries. So I look forward to conversations about uh, where we can improve the distinction between them, how passengers connect with the various companies in both sectors, uh, and creating a path forward. Adrian. So when we look at the taxi coalition, the taxi community, and you know, if you have the leader of the Taxis Alliance, it's like different sectors. And most of them, there are men and women, the majority immigrants, uh, who are working behind the wheel, supporting themselves, supporting the family. And when we look at a particular case of the livery taxi drivers, we also have seen, and this is a you know, the New York Times did a good article, but the New York Times article is only 50% of the reality because the Times only focus on the back actors. And yes, we are addressing the back actors, but no one is focusing about their regulatory uh, responsibility, how we feel, how does 50% of the contribution of the crisis or bringing the taxi industry where we are here today. So as I care for the yellow taxi medallion, as I say, I don't have con larger constituents in my community. That's not my immediate base. I've been fighting for them because I believe in the right thing to do. But I also feel that the livery taxi drivers have been going through a similar crisis. Semen, car ser servers, a uh, a high class, all those bases, they used to have 900, 600 drivers. How can we work together to be sure that those, that, that sector that they used to represent like 40,000, and today they are only like 12, 15,000, are able to get also the support that they need in order to continue providing the services in our city? I, I agree, I think it's important to help um, all of the, the various types of bases thrive, um, particularly those that uh, aren't high volume. Um, and I think it is a tricky balance to find ways to allow them to uh, grow and serve the, the demands of their communities, um, while also not creating loopholes that take us back to 24, 2014, 2015, when we saw explosive growth in, in the black car sector. So uh, I'd look forward to working with you to find a way to, to craft measures that, that protect both the interests of those base owners uh, and drivers within the, the livery sector, um, as well as balance that against the needs of, of regulating so we don't create loopholes. My last question, and thank you, Chair, it is on, as you know, that drivers, they were allowed to do using the roof and inside the car to advertise. It, in, and in that became an additional sources, source of revenue for them. But with the recent decision by the court, uh, now those drivers for the full hire vehicle, they are in fear because they don't know if they will be allowed to continue uh, using the roof and the inside of their vehicle to advertise. What is your uh, approach to that situation? Yeah, I look forward to t talking with you on that. I did see the recent decision about that. Um, I do wonder how that will be impacted given the uh, FHV driver income rules. So I would like to see how both those play out in terms of how we can best maximize driver pay. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for being here today, Mr. Roth. Uh, a lot has been said. Uh, today about your stellar background. So thank you for all that you've done, your service, your commitment. I think that you truly do have a heart um, for which the position that you've been uh, nominated for today. So for that, I am extremely grateful. Uh, I represent District 28 in Queens, Jamaica, Richmond Hill, South Ozone Park. We have a huge number of medallion drivers. On a day-to-day -day basis, I can see throughout my district cars that were formerly used for TLC, uh, cars that formerly had emblems that are now pretty much whitewashed and painted over. So I, I, I have just a couple of follow-up questions because what I see on a daily basis is medallion owners are hemorrhaging, 
livelihoods are hemorrhaging. You mentioned in your testimony that, that the position calls for a transformative leader, and that really is indeed what is needed in this role. I'm trying to get a little bit closer to what that transformation leadership looks like. The speaker asked some very, very pointed questions, and I just wasn't comfortable with the specificity of response. He spoke about the package of bills that we have. I have a bill in that package as well. And that bill has to do with assessing finances mm -hmm. um, of drivers to ensure um, feasibility of ownership. So we're really trying to do our best to protect the drivers on this end. As a transformative leader, um, we looked at your leadership. You responded in a 60-day assessment of how the industry was regulated, uh, working with the task force. I'm just a little bit more concerned with the livelihood of these drivers. So if we can just pin you down a little bit closer in looking at a remedy to make these drivers whole, I think that's going to start to make me a little bit more comfortable uh, with the transformation. Can we at least get a commitment from you today for a remedy to make these drivers whole within that 60 to 90 day period? Would you be willing to give us a commitment today to say yes, I am going to look to make these drivers whole as a part of my assessment roundup and my entire assessment on this position. Can we get a commitment to you to take a look at a remedy to make these drivers whole? I think the remedy is that we all share the aim of alleviating suffering wherever possible. I think it would be uh, premature for me to uh, specify the exact nature of the policy measures without digging into it more deeply. Um, that's why I do want to hit the ground running and immediately assess where we're at, see what all of the policy tools are available, and work very closely with the council to find out what we can do. And I think there's probably a lot of measures on the table that we ought to try uh, that don't put money back into the pockets of predatory lenders. I would agree with that. Um, and, and, and just finally, I would just really, really encourage you. I know that. You, your, your confirmation is pending right now. We're going to have follow-up questions and continue this dialogue that has, has been a long time coming, quite frankly, if you're confirmed. We've got a long way to go with an industry that is just so broken and bruised. So again, I thank you for your testimony. Um, I would still like to feel more comfortable, um, but I think we're getting there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Ross, it's good to see you, and you. glad that you reminded me that we did work together when you were at TLC on commuter van, and we really appreciate uh, what you were able to do to help us in, in my district. And I'm really glad to hear in your testimony that you did talk about your focus um, to address ways of strengthening uh, the yellow industry to protect driver um, that own their medallion who are struggling. And I spoke to uh, an owner, and he said, don't call me a medallion owner. I'm an owner of a huge debt. And they're struggling. And I think that when the speaker asked you about, you know, like the loan forgiveness, and I, I heard you respond about, yes, we don't want to benefit the predatory lenders but they're still doing, you know, their dirty work. Because I spoke to um, an owner yesterday, and I just couldn't believe the story he told me. He, he owns $800,000 $800, debt on his medallion, and he works seven days a week. He has four children. And the bank that he borrowed the money from went bankrupt, Signature Bank. And then they sold his loan to a credit union, but they were asking him to pay up front, the bank, 200000 He doesn't have $200,000 to pay up front. And then the bank sold it to a credit union. And guess what? The credit union is asking him for the full amount of 800000 
That is not right. So when we're talking about, you, you were talking about setting up uh, a driver assistant, we gotta find legal help and like really go after these bad guys who are taking advantage you know, of these hardworking drivers. A lot of them are immigrant, they want the American dream, they work hard, and now they are at a crisis. And when they're talking about the driver that killed himself, a lot of these owner of these big debts, that thought is in their mind because of the finance. It's not because they have mental issue. It's because they're stressed out about how can they support their family and to be able to pay back, you know, that loan that they were being taken advantage of. So we have to find something. I mean, the speaker is talking about, we gotta find a way that we can give some immediate relief and not like, no, no, you know, whether it's loan forgiveness, whether it's helping them restructure, we gotta make sure that if they work seven days a week, they gotta be able to bring back an income that support their family. You know, they still have to pay, you still have to pay on the loan every week, every month. So that's not right, right? So I think we need some really immediate relief on that. And the other issue that I, I wanted to talk, talk to you about is really protecting all the drivers. Like with the app base, we heard from another app base driver even though I really don't utilize them, I support yellow because it's very easy for me to get a yellow cap because I'm, I'm down here in lower Manhattan. Um, I just don't understand why some of my neighbors, you know, wanted to be picked up right in front of their doors and congest, congest the street. And every time I get to talk to a driver, they tell me the same story. They're struggling so much now than when they started 15 or 20 years ago. So. And I didn't realize the app company are treating the app driver as robots. They deactivate them if there is a complaint, one complaint. They can just deactivate the driver with no due process, right? If there's a complaint about yellow cab driver, TLC, you have a process, right, that they could tell their side of the story. But with the app uh, driver, they don't even have that opportunity. They just deactivate, they send you a text or whatever. So I think that needs to be changed, whether we have to pass legislation or TLC can do the rule change. We cannot allow these app companies to treat the drivers like robots, that they're not human. They cannot just take advantage of that. And I heard from your answer uh, to some of the questions that you do support continuing the cap on, FA, uh, on uh, the, for higher vehicle drivers? Yeah, I'm very thankful to the council for your leadership on that, absolutely. That's, that's good, I mean, that, that is a, a very, you know, good start on that. But to make sure that they are getting adequate pay and not being taken advantage of, that's something that I think TLC has to continue um, to focus on and also work with us to find a way to give some immediate relief to this medallion owner that owns a lot of death. Mm -hmm. We gotta make sure that they don't go off the edge, right? And they're suffering, and we really need to find a way to help them. Um, and um, so hopefully, you know, we can find a way to work together to go after these predatory lenders, whether it's credit union, whether it's bank, they cannot get away with that. And I think we should really figure out, like, legally, how the city and DLC can work together to really go after these bank actors. That's right, that's right. No, I just wanna say it's very sad for me to sit here and listen to all this and know this is going on, because I remember as a little girl, <clears throat> if you owned a cab, you were set for life. Yep. You were absolutely set for life. It was your retirement, you didn't have to worry. None of this ever went on. And it's very sad that it has deteriorated to such a degree as it is today. It, something really, really has to be done because the, the yellow cab is the only uh, car service that makes an actual investment in the medallion. They're the only car service that lays out this money, does the lending, and it's very, very sad to see the deterioration of an industry that at one time was considered, you had a medallion, you were made, you, you were a lucky person. 
Yeah, and there should be really some uniform, you know, rules that so the, the yellow cab is not being, you know, taken advantage of, on, you know, versus the for hire vehicle. And also even for the for hire vehicle workers that have to lease their car or rent their car, payments should be, you know, not so high that they can't make a living. I mean, those issues that I think TLC really, really have to look at. And unfortunately, I think the administration, we have to take responsibility. Because I remember my first term under the Bloomberg administration, the auction of the medallion, that's what was used to close the, the budget gap, okay? It was like, wow, the city can collect how many millions from the medallion sale? And that helps, you know, with the budget shortfall. And that should not be the case. And so now, you know, we have to do our job to really try to fix it. So I look forward to working with you uh, and the Taxi Workers Alliance and all the advocates and all the work, because they have suggestions. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to wait. They have their list of suggestions. Sure. What can mm -hmm. happen now to bring some relief That's to right. the, the drivers? Thank you, Councilman. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Traeger. Thank you, Chair uh, Koswitz, and to all my colleagues, and uh, thank you, Mr. R Roth. Uh, for being here today, and I, I, I listened carefully to your words uh, about uh, using your leadership experience and, and applying it uh, to, the, to the crisis at hand. Um, from your view, um, when and how did this crisis begin from, from, where, from where you are right now? So, you know, my past experience at the TLC, uh, when I came into my role there, uh, there was massive disruption in the uh, uh, FHV sector. We were experiencing explosive growth by new companies that the world had never seen before. With the touch of a button, a passenger could um, request a ride and it would show up at its doorstep. S and, and it did that all in a segment of uh, the TLC regulated industries that um, wasn't created for that express purpose. So we were really trying to figure out how to uh, govern and regulate uh, the disruption of that industry. At that time, I think with that disruption, we started to see changes in uh, companies that drivers were working for. A number of drivers left the yellow uh, to go drive in the for hire vehicle sector for these new companies. Uh, so we started to see trips drop for the yellow side. And I think that was, in my mind, what we were trying to shore up and regulate and create parity, as Council Member Chen alluded to, between these various sectors so that the city could determine how to regulate them moving forward. In my mind, that's when the real, uh, that disruption is when things started to turn and we started to see a crisis in terms of all of the regulated industries. Um, and with the trip drops and trips um, and drivers moving between sectors, I think that's when you started to see changes in the medallion uh, value and I will say that's also likely when uh, many of those loans came to term. I know a lot of these loans had balloon payments tied to them. I suspect some of those came due in 2015, 16, 17, uh, after the, the last auction. Uh, you mentioned before that you were not uh, in charge of the auctions and, and that part. Um, and, and I appreciate your, your candor on that. Uh, and I I believe I heard you say that TLC bears responsibility for the lack of regulation and oversight. To your knowledge, has anyone from TLC resigned or been fired or have been held accountable for this crisis up to this date? Uh, I, I think there's been a change in the leadership at the TLC, uh, certainly since the last auction. Uh, and even prior to that. So the leadership that was there in the prior administration, I don't believe is any longer there. But there are folks who leave to take on various, I'm talking about accountability. To your knowledge, has anyone been held accountable in any way for, for what has happened so far? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Not, not, yeah, not to my knowledge either. Uh, either. Um, to me, there are some striking similarities between uh, what, is, what is happening here and also in terms of what happened in terms of the housing crisis, housing bubble. There are some folks who, who say that the housing crisis was in 2008, but to me the crisis also began when many working families were duped by subprime mortgage companies to take loans that these companies knew that they were not capable of handling and put enormous stress and burdens on those working families. 
And it only became a crisis when the big banks complained that their bottom line margins uh, were, not, were not no longer in, in, in black ink, that they were now deeping into the red. And then the Congress had to uh, pass TARP to bail out the big banks, but left the working families, basically screwed them. And so there are some striking similarities that I see here, because to me, the real crisis, in addition to, I mean, the, the fact is, yes, you had this explosion of the uh, of these uh, app-based app, app -based companies, but who was watching the ship with regards to the market and these auctions and, and, and just people, working, working class people? What was with the case that my colleague had just explained? This is a working class person who has now become basically a slave to the debt. And, you know, we, we, we hear, we, we read about these terrible, tra tragic, painful stories of people taking their own lives uh, because of this situation. So in order to solve this crisis, Mr. Roth, I think you have to first have an honest, sobering assessment of how we got here in the first place. How is it that the term taxi king even became possible? You know, the mayor has a slogan he uses about there's a lot of money in this country, but it's in, it's in the wrong hands. How is it that one person accumulated over 800 city medallions hmm. under the city's watch? We have progressives who rail against Wall Street. Meanwhile, many of these so-called progressives, and I blame the, the, the past administration, Michael Bloomberg bears a lot of responsibility. There's no question about that. But they oversaw, they oversaw the origins of this crisis. And so I just want to echo, I think, a lot of the, the passion and the p powerful testimony and, and the uh, serious concerns that we have in terms of a crisis, in terms of what working families and, and drivers are experiencing, but there's also a crisis in confidence that we have right now. And, and so we, there's, there's a lot of work to do, and I, uh, it is a very difficult position that you are seeking in. I, I, don't, I don't envy that role, but I do believe in, in, your, uh, in your work ahead in terms of sizing up the crisis. It's important that you identify how and when this actually began in order to solve it. Mm -hmm. It's not when the billionaires or these big companies complained or the banks complained that they're, that, that they're not getting their payments in. That's not when the crisis begins. The crisis is when working people got screwed, where the people whose job it was to make sure that this never happened in the first place failed to do their job and, quite frankly, should not be working in, in, in this role anymore. And the fact that no one's been held accountable speaks volumes as well. So, I, again, I thank you for, for, for being here today. A lot of work to do, and I thank the chair for her time. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. We're going to hear from the uh, public now. If you... Greg Waltman, I want to, I just want to say that each speaker has three minutes. You can begin. Good afternoon, chairs, um, council, general counsel. Greg Waltman um, from G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company. Uh, we also specialize in a variety of other types of proprietary innovation. Um, without a doubt, uh, the gentleman that just testified is beyond qualified for the position. Um, but the solutions set forth will be critical in shaping the future of the medallion market. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you have to understand what's going on, understand the business model. People want to look flashy at clubs, so they get Uber, Lyft, and other types of ride-sharing um, apps so they can 
get these vehicles. And this strips demand away from TLC. So what's going on is that, you know, who controls these nightclubs, clubs, um, people that produce music, you know, have a, a very big say in where these ride-sharing apps are going, and maybe they didn't understand that before. So, yeah, it, it's one, one thing where you have a value type of um, issue where you're having uh, unprecedented growth type of um, narratives with these, these medallion markets, and obviously Michael Cohen in relation to that. But it all goes kind of back to a crypto-fascist state of California and delegating and dictating to and trying to hold different types of entities hostage, where you have the president try to essentially placating to the social media Uber um, kind of paradigm that you have in the tech space. So it's, it's reshaping it with something that's going to make sense. Um, I've, in the, I'm in the preliminary stages of developing an application for that, for the TLC, called Sleigh Ride. Sleigh Ride people are packages. And, and if you can get the right people on board with that to reshape it, and uh, including a military type of, um, you know, type of backdrop where you're, you know, you have the type of synergies necessary and you're building these synergies with different types of club and club owners and people from the clubs have interest in the application that TLC is rebranding itself under, then you can reorganize and then take the market share back by implementing different types of um, vehicle uh, enhancement and fleet enhancement types of strategies that strip away demand from Uber. So, I mean, it, it's a complex, it's a complex uh, issue, and obviously you have hedge funds and other types of entities buying medallions and things like that. But, you know, like I said, it's, it's one of these issues where, no. you know, it, 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 it requires a multi-pronged approach. So when you're, when you're re-strategizing, restructuring, reorganizing the market, you know, do, wh where, are we gonna, where are we gonna go with it? And, it, and it's, it's, you know, one of those issues where, although the gentleman is- Time is up. You know, uh, thank you for your time, thank you for your time. Okay. Carolyn Pratt. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, my name is Carolyn Pratz. I'm a medallion owner. Am I the only individual medallion owner here? I'll tell you the rest of them. I got to tell you, when the other 6,000 individual medallion owners hear what went on here today, they're not going to be very happy. I can't believe what I heard here today. You're actually discussing should we even continue to have a medallion system? A medallion system where you had middle class people who owned a valuable city franchise that was sold to them by New York City, and you're going to replace them with slave labor that work for a company that lost $14 billion. Uber's going to be gone. Once the shareholders sell out in October, November, they'll be gone, but you're still going to have 135,000 cars out there. You better start thinking about what you want to do about that. I'm sorry the speaker left because I think he's asking the wrong questions. He's asking, should the yellow medallion segment have been regulated better? That's the wrong question. The correct question is, was the FHV sector regulated properly? And the answer is no. The TLC bent, broke, ignored, and changed rules for the last nine years, and that's what enabled the multinational corporate predator to take over the business. And Jeffrey Roth was there for part of this time. He was there from October 2014 through May of 2016. During that time, we embarked on the so-called congestion study. That was not just a congestion study. The uh, request for proposal and the outline of what was supposed to be accomplished was to come up with an entirely new roadmap for the entire industry. He was involved in that study. I have a 4,000-page dossier. I'm going to say that again, a 4,000-page dossier that I received through someone who had done a FOIL. 
all about the so-called congestion study. And that's what is revealed in those pages. And I'm willing to share them with anybody who wants it. For some reason, nobody's asked me to take a look at it. His name is on the emails, correspondence between him, McKinsey and Company, Uber, Lyft. You know, what's going on with that? You need to have another hearing, and you need to ask him about that study and what was revealed in it. Because I think, as the speaker said, we're at a very critical juncture, and we really can't afford to have any more mistakes being made. And there's also something else. You don't have good numbers. Everybody throws around numbers. I'm a medallion owner. I don't owe a dime, but I'm going down the tubes with everybody else. There are hundreds, perhaps, actually there are thousands of medallions that don't have any loans against them at all. Somebody who I trust pretty well in this area told me about 20% of medallions don't have any loans against them. Then there's a very large group, people yeah. who work the medallions, oh, maybe 200,000, 300,000, which is certainly mad. I'm saying you don't have good numbers, and you're going to make policy, and you don't even know what you're talking about. Okay. I think the city interviewed 300 people. You have That's to not up. enough. You have to sum up. There are other people that want to speak. Look, we've had nine years of ignorance of the rules. Oh, you, uh, your time deliberate, is up. deliberate ignorance of the rules. That's how this happened. Your time is up. Thank you. Richard Lipsky and Baravi Des Desau. He's the. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Beta Vitasai. I'm the executive director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. We represent the proud men and women who work for a living in this industry, whether they be yellow cab owner drivers, lease drivers, or drivers that work for Uber, Lyft, VL, or a black car company, or livery base, or a green cab. We've been organizing in this industry for over 23 years. And it has always been a really difficult industry to organize in because we're a workforce that's predominantly immigrant, people of color, where you know the workers have always been hidden behind all the wealth in this industry. And man, we thought it was hard enough to fight the multimillionaires, but when we had to start fighting the multi-billionaires, this fight has taken on a whole new dimension. I think it's important that for anybody who takes on the position of chairperson of the TLC to understand that this is a crisis that took years in the making and it will take us years to come out of. That person needs to be visionary and they need to be bold. They need to serve the interests of the men and women who are in an unprecedented crisis. Many people couldn't believe why there have not been more TLC officials who themselves resigned, who came out and said, we needed a vehicle cap back in 2015. We didn't get one, but we as regulators can't stand by and let politics play out while the workforce that keeps us in business is literally killing itself from poverty and from despair. There's been such a massive failure to regulate this industry. That failure is not only about lack of regulation by seven agencies, by the way, not just the TLC, of predatory medallion lending prices. It's also been the lack of utter regulation of Wall Street finance companies that came in and really interrupted a path of financial stability, not, not for the owner drivers, but for the lease drivers, for the actual majority working drivers in this industry, whose lives were turned upside down with the saturation of vehicles, cutting fares and a, you know deregulation where drivers were not able to file complaints of wage theft or any of that. The vehicle cap that this council passed last year was the first step that we needed to bring back stability into this industry. The hearing that will take place at the TLC next week should not be put on hold. 
We need those rules to be passed. We need to have one minimum rate of fare across the industry and for living wage and other wage protection rules to be passed by this council and the TLC. I'd like to end by saying I'd like to officially submit today for the record a petition to initiate rulemaking that we're submitting to the Taxi and Limousine Commission today that when the next chairman takes their post, we want them to start off knowing there's a cap in place, utilization rules in place, and what they can begin to work on is living wage, job security, and a raise for all drivers to bring everybody out of poverty and despair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. It's a delight to be here since uh, you and I are probably the only ones who have been here for as long as we have. And uh, it's always good to be here to sit with my good friend, Bervi, and uh, talk about a real crisis that's happening. Uh, you know, I, I came into this thinking that it was really bad optics for the mayor to designate a potential chair of the TLC who was part of that agency, that commission, while all the you-know-what hit the fan. Whether Mr. Roth had culpability for what happened, I think it's still bad optics, but in listening to Mr. Roth, my initial concerns were magnified because I don't think he quite gets what this crisis that Beravie has been talking about here. He talks about the explosive growth in 2014. Now, I don't know if you folks are aware of the old discredited scientific theory of spontaneous generation. People would see maggots growing on, on, on spoiling meat, and they thought that the maggots were being generated from the meat. What they didn't understand was that there were flies laying eggs and Francisco Reddle disproved the theory of spontaneous generation. Mr. Roth has re-initiated the whole theory of spontaneous generation as if these app cars exploded spontaneously. No, they came because of the culpability of the TLC's leadership. It wasn't just predatory loans. What it was was as the predatory loans were being given out, corruption, inducement, defrauding of these medallion owners. At the same time, they were letting FHVs come in under rules that did not control their growth. So the fact is that the TLC since 2014 has been redolent with anti-taxi bias. And the rules that they have promulgated and will continue to promulgate they had a whole 38-page congestion study. You know what one word was missing from the entire study? Taxi. Imagine that, doing an entire congestion study and not looking at taxi. So if you're going to approve of a commissioner, it should be a commissioner who is going to tell you we need to thoroughly overhaul the way in which the TLC operates. We need to look at the medallion franchise as a vehicle that needs to be preserved, as Council Member Chin has pointed out, this is an important vehicle to protect. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Roth did not indicate to you, and sh you should not have the confidence that he will do exactly that. Thank you very much. Paul Rivera. Good afternoon. Dear Idanis Rodriguez, Richie Torres, Kalina Rivera, New York City's public advocate, Jumani Williams, thank you for signing my petition to have the New York City TLC reformed. I would also ask for you to please encourage your fellow council members that have not yet signed on to please do so. Currently, I'm waiting for a response from Carlos Menchaca, 
Brad Lander, Fernando Cabrera, Margaret Chin, and the rest of the city, and the rest of the city council members to sign my petition. Mr. Rodriguez, on June 24, 2019, the Committee on Transportation Oversight Investigations tried to throw Acting Commissioner Bill Hines under the bus. Mr. Rodriguez, a na I'm a native New Yorker from the Bronx. I'm here fighting for my rights as a New Yorker, as a New York City TLC driver. Mr. Rodriguez, you are part of the 51 gatekeepers of New York City. For more than five years, the gatekeepers have left the gates of New York City unguarded. Mr. Rodriguez, I don't have to remind you that last month, you and co-chairman Mr. Torres openly admitted that the city failed the drivers. More importantly, you failed your fellow New Yorker. I would like to make a correction. The city did not fail the drivers. It was you, Mr. Tor Mr. Rodriguez. It was you, Mr. Torres. It was the Transportation Committee. It was the Taxi and Limousine Commission. It was the New York City Council. Attention, Mr. Rodriguez. Attention, New York City Council. The reform of the TLC will come from, will come from the drivers. The reform will come from New Yorkers, it will come from the yellow drivers, it will come from the green drivers, it will come from the base drivers. No city council member or any other city elected official should not and will not take any credit for the reform of the TLC. The reform will come from the TLC driver. Hashtag drivers unite, hashtag reform TLC, hashtag cap drivers, hashtag do it now. Thank you. Reform the TLC. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, this meeting will be recessed until July 23rd. I know that.